Welcome, Jen and Adam, to the Flower Podcast. Thanks Thank for you for having us. us. Oh. Yeah. Oh, jinx. Oh, jinx. We do that a lot. <laughs> Yeah, this is it's always fun when we get to interview two people at the same time in the same room. It's just like there's like a different energy almost in, during these interviews. And so um, I've enjoyed following you guys and, and watching what you do and produce. It's always so beautiful. And I have been looking forward to this interview now for a few weeks since we talked last. And you guys have been busy. You guys have been doing lots of fun stuff. Oh, my um, gosh. Yeah, we have been. Yeah, it's been crazy. <laughs> It's like so, we never slowed down. We always want to take January off and it didn't really happen. It doesn't work out that way. Yeah. January is when we go like speak at local garden clubs and botanical centers and garden shows. Oh, that's amazing. Well, it's, um, well, I mean, you guys are in demand. I mean, you guys do a lot of great stuff and people want to learn from you. So that's one reason why. Um, I think today is going to be really good. I uh, always like to start at the beginning. So you've got to say so. And and yours might be a little more complicated. I don't know. How how did you guys get into the world of growing flowers? Who wants to? T- you can tell it. Oh, well, well. me? Yeah. yeah. I usually, so the story goes, Adam wanted to, Adam had a <laughs> real big, <laughs> it, it's really his fault. Well, it's a good thing. It was like a happy accident. But Adam's the one who wanted to move to a farm, uh, grow our own food. He was really interested in permaculture. He finally convinced me. I mean, he chipped away at me for like 10 years. Like he's like, I'm on a farm, 10 years, 10 years. Uh, Finally, he chipped away at me enough that I was like, okay, yeah, let's make this happen. Time, Time to do it. He convinced me to move back to my hometown, which is where we live now. It's a little tiny town in Iowa. South of Des Moines, a little bit, um, 5,000 people. And we preface it, the story by me making sure to let everyone know that I made her move back to her hometown. I can't imagine <laughs> moving back to South Louisiana. So. <laughs> oh my goodness. It's the cutest little town ever. So I yeah. have no regrets other than, you know, zero anonymity. Everyone here knows me and, you know, either knows my family or knows me from high school. So that's a little weird, but other than that, it was the best thing ever. But so he started growing vegetables and I said, well, if you're going to grow vegetables, I'm going to grow a small little garden of flowers. I started out with a 20 by 30 little space that we grew on and uh, gradually expanded from there. We did farmer's market that first year. And what we were seeing is the flowers were flying out of there immediately. And Adam like really honed in on it. He's like, uh, we need to grow more flowers. Yeah. (laughs) Well, when, you know, I was very idealistic when we moved to the farm before the reality of a farm set in. So I came here wanting to do everything like grow our own meat and vegetables and fruits and make honey. And um, we quickly realized that we were kind of stretching ourselves pretty thin. We had too many irons in the fire. And uh, yeah, when Jen grew these flowers and they were successful at the farmer's market, it just slowly kind of chipped out everything else and uh yeah now we're flowers and we we couldn't sell a tomato at the farmer's market for the life of us no no one will buy our vegetables anymore we we tried we tried they were like no we don't want those things so we just grow food for ourselves and we kind of realized that you know giving up some of these things giving up my cattle we can support other farmers by buying their meats and their veggies and their fruits and so, honey. yeah, so as a way, it, it just, you know, getting smarter as you farm. Oh, I love that. And I love the idea that you think of that. You think of supporting your other, your neighbors, so to speak, in a small community like that. So yeah. um, that's, that's really great. So how much, or how much land do you grow on, you grow flowers on now? You started off with what, 20 by 30? What are you up to now? Uh, we, well, we have a 20 acre farm, um, but we were flowers on about seven and a half and we're growing to about eight and a half, nine acres this year because we keep adding wildflower installations <laughs> and lavender actually. and lavender. Yeah. So, um, so wildflower installations, what is that about? Is that just for cutting or is that for photo shoots? And what is that for? Uh, Well, it's really valuable for photo shoots, but after being here quite a few years, I was really yearning for just some big bunches of flowers, big patches, big fields of flowers that could stay there, that we didn't have to harvest and 
kind of chop out? Well, as, as a cut flower farm, uh, people don't realize when they come out to visit, like if you see flowers sitting in our flower fields, it means we're actually losing money. We're losing productivity, <laughs> but that's what makes a flower farm dreamy uh. and beautiful. Right. Uh, so Adam's like, you know what, we need to just plant these wildflower installations for a beautiful backdrop so that when people come out to our flower farm, they see flowers and they're like, this place is amazing. So that's really where it came from. Yeah. I mean, we started with uh, an acre sunflower installation our very first time, and it was incredibly successful. We saw how much it was a benefit to the pollinators and it just excited us to keep going in that direction. But we do have photographers come out, they rent the farm and they bring their clients out to take photos, both in the wildflower installations and in the lavender too. Yep. So I think that's a great idea because people, it's, it's so crazy um, how often I, I hear that very same thing. This isn't what I expected. And, you know, no, there's no flowers or, you know, why? And people don't really stop to think. Um, you're right. It's money in the field if you've got flowers sitting out there. So being able to grow these these installations, I think, is just is brilliant. Um, uh, I'd love I'd love to see some pictures of those. <laughs> oh, absolutely. Yeah. We'll send you some. So, it, it is. It's incredible. I mean, it looks like they're miles long, but you know, it's it's an acre. But an acre of of especially with the sunflowers, it was insane. And the way you planted them. Uh, up against the the sunset, it was in, gorgeous, just gorgeous. Our property is contoured, not super hilly, but it's not flat, so we're able to create a lot of perspective. <laughs> the the hills awesome. help with like making fields look endless in pictures. So photographers love it like crazy. Oh wow, that's awesome. That's great. Okay, so now you've mentioned lavender a couple times. So now, uh, how much lavender do you grow? Right now, two and a half acres mm -hmm. and soon to be three and a half. We have another acre installation that we're planting here on the farm of lavender this spring. And it's, you know, it's funny how it sounds like, oh, yay, another, another acre. And then I'm like, oh, yeah, <laughs> we actually have to put the work into doing that. <laughs> so we know we have a lot of work ahead of us, but we have everything all planned out. It's just like, oh, yeah, I'm uh, not quite ready to get my hands in the, in the ground yet. Yeah, we need 10 employees, but. It's just Jen and I yeah, yeah. <laughs> right now. Anyway. Yeah. We'll, we'll have a couple employees in the season. That's insane. So how, when you plant lavender, like how long does it take for it to actually be profitable? It takes about a year. So it does take a year to get wow. it established. It will bloom the first year, but second year is when we really start getting the productivity off of it, being able mm. to cut it and dry it and use it for products or dried flowers, all of those, all of those things. Sure. So one of the questions I always love to ask, um, and, and I usually catch people off guard with is like, how many different things do you guys grow? Like just generally speaking, you know, cause with that much land, you're growing a lot of flowers. Oh Yeah. I don't yeah. know. We tried to estimate it once. It was like at least 200 different varieties of flowers wow. that we grow here. Yeah. Um, lavender and dahlias are our biggest that we grow here at Pepper okay. Hero, but we grow all kinds of annuals and perennials. We have lots of videos about our favorites of, of the ones we grow here on YouTube. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, too many to name, literally yeah. over 200 lots. different varieties. <laughs> and then Adam kind of talked about some of the, the diversity we have here. Aside from flowers, we, we have orchards, we have fruit growing, oh, wow. we, have, we have grapes growing, raspberries, all, all the things. So that I would say that's one nice remnant of our uh, diversity, passion, and homesteading fever when we first got here that's like we're really reaping the rewards from that and we actually use some of that in our design work you know owning mm. and operating a flower farm we use some of those those fruit branches in our designs and in our bouquets yeah the unripened fruit branches are awesome in an arrangement so cool yeah i'm really uh would love to see that sometime i think um you know it's interesting uh, you, you mentioned the market bouquets. So what, who do you sell your flowers to mostly? Uh, we our our biggest market is the downtown Des Moines farmer's market. And it's mm -hmm. one of the biggest, if not the biggest farmer's market in the country. Wow. Um, so it's a really good market for us. And we sell to a few select local florists and a, a little market that is uh, in Des Moines as well. Um, and a lot of on-farm sales. Yeah. 
We do, uh, we offer a CSA. So we have CSA customers coming out this season. And then every, usually every Saturday we do uh, a come cut your own bouquet, come out to the farm, wow. visit the farm, but it's like a, a pre-ticketed sales kind of thing so that we know exactly how many people are coming out. As you can imagine, you know, for a small farm, we have to know, we can't leave the gate wide open. We literally have to know how many people are coming out each weekend so that we don't have thousands show up and yeah. no room to put everybody. And we know there's only, you know, a certain amount of people that we can sustain on our land. So we try to keep it small, private and intimate so that everyone also gets a really amazing experience when they come out to do that. Yeah. And it's also our home. So we, oh, yeah. you know, we want to <laughs> have, have a little bit of an element of control. <laughs> Yeah, you don't want people showing up just willy nilly every, you know, every Saturday and like, yeah, that could get kind of crazy. Yeah, and um, we're actually we're doing a, a new concept this year where we're doing a design class the day before, usually on a Saturday night, very limited amount of floral design classes. But something we're, we're doing this year is we're doing bloom bar Sundays. So usually our floral design classes are held in this event barn that we're in now. It's air conditioned and our thought is we always have flowers left over from our floral design classes. So mm. the next day we're going to do this bloom bar Sunday where people can come out and pick a bouquet from our bloom bar that we already have set up from the floral design class. So that's something new that we're doing. And mm -hmm. it was like, Hey, how do we use the, all these, all of these flowers that are left over from floral design classes? This is a great way to do that and to have a great customer experience. Yeah. We, we always cut a crazy amount of flowers for our floral design classes because we want to have a, you know, not only a, a huge bar of flowers for people to choose from, it's a beautiful display also. Yeah, sure, sure. Um, so how many people, when you have a design class, like is it's open to how many people? Uh, it is limited to 12 people. Okay. And that is, it, that, that's just kind of our sweet spot. Jen and I do the classes together. So it's each of us managing six people. Well, we all, uh, both of us get around to everybody. We keep our design classes small and intimate. If we had a class of a hundred, it would be just a completely different experience than 12 people. You know, it's, it's a much more intimate experience and Jen and I want to have fun in the class. And these classes are our favorite thing to do here on the farm. So if we're having a good time, everyone else is having a good time. We really sure. found out our, our sweet spot is six people per person for us as teachers. Anything more than that, people don't really get a great one-on-one -on -one experience. I mean, part of the fun is people want to ask us questions. They want to have a great time, but we, we find it's different from class to class. Some people are like, really want that hands-on like design instruction and others are like, Hey, I just came out to have fun with my girlfriends. Leave me alone. I want to play with flowers. So you really have to gauge your audience, you know, know who you're working with, know what they're looking for and expect. So really we set the press, we, we set the expectations up front, like, Hey, we will stay out of your hair. If you are here to have fun and play with flowers. However, if you need help and want instruction, grab us. And we're more than willing to help you, but you know, you really have to know, and they have to engage with you if, you know, they want your help. Yeah. And, and we can see who's struggling in silence. <laughs> we, you know, we'll, help, we'll give them a little bit more attention. Yeah. The, for, the hardest thing people have trouble with is just getting started, which, you know, once you get people rolling with it, they're like, oh yeah, just like riding a bike. <laughs> sure. Well, I know when we were talking earlier, I, one of the things I was asking about was sort of your background with design. And I'd love for you to share some of your learning opportunities because I, I was pretty fascinated by that. Okay, yeah, absolutely. So I, I actually grew up watching my grandmother do floral design, mm -hmm. um, which everybody's like, really? I'm like, yeah, you know, my grandma <laughs> entered a lot of floral design events at our local county fair. And I just grew up watching her do floral design. She'd send me out with a pair of snips. She'd say, oh, go cut me some more baby's breath. Really, she was just trying to ditch me because I'm sure it was all in her hair. Um, yeah, she would send me out with a pair of snips and I'd go cut flowers for her. She's like, go cut me some pretty things that I can include in here. Uh, so that was my first, you know, from a child, like watching her and really studying her. And, you know, it's funny how you internalize that later in life. And I've heard a lot of people saying that, that you don't realize what's sinking into you at a, at a young age, but it definitely was. 
And then into my adult life, I kind of came back to it. I noticed I, you know, had a flair for putting flowers together and I've been inspired by a lot of other floral designers out there. So uh, the first one I'll bring up is Philippa Craddock. Uh, I had the opportunity, Adam and I actually traveled to London and I studied with Philippa Craddock and her team for a week learning wow. you know, how to make those beautiful arches like she made at St. George's. Um, it was a, an experience of a lifetime and uh, it was fun to experience England and to go to her gardens. We also had a, the opportunity. It was, to, a, it was amazing. We went to Kew and Chatsworth and uh, well, absolutely incredible. Um, so that's, that's maybe my biggest one. And that was the most fun I've ever had. I was exhausted after that week though. I will say that like we got to the last day of that floral design workshop and I was just like, I don't, I don't know if I have it in me to do anything. I just wanted to have fun and maybe relax a little bit. We, I was totally wiped out. It was work, a lot of work. Um, I've also taken a couple, I went to Nashville actually, and yeah. uh, to the Cordell and studied with um, Holly from Rose and Gold and uh, Ashley Byerly from Tinge. And then uh, I went to Seattle and I studied with Steve Moore. And that was really fun to My learn goodness. his design style. He has such a good eye. And again, that was another one. I was like, oh, I'm exhausted. That was a full week of flowering. Wow. Um, what an incredible, diverse background. I mean, that was really, I mean, that's a lot of, uh, I, I don't know. When I think of the the kinds of teachers you just talked about and each one has their own take and twist and design style. What a great, what a great opportunity for you. So. Yeah. I, you know, I was thinking about that, Scott, and I was like, I think I first looked at those designers and I liked their aesthetic. Sure. But what I, what I found with each one of those is like, you can't replicate their design style. You can go and, and kind of feel it out and get some tips and tricks, but ultimately at the end of the day, you have to find your own design style inside of you. It's your own inner artist that comes out. You know that too. Mm -hmm. Everybody's style is a little bit different, but there's been little, little nuggets that I've learned and little inspirational tips that I've gotten from them along the way. But again, you can't imitate them. You really have to dig in and really find your own, your own design style as you're, you know, trying to find your inner artist, I guess. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Can't think of a better way to say it, but that's, it's absolutely true. Yeah. I appreciate you saying it that way too, because I think sometimes people walk away and they, they, they feel like they learned at the feet of someone and that doesn't make what they're applying in their own lives legitimate, you know, and it's like, it is legitimate. Now you're making it your own. Yeah. Um, you're taking away those pieces to impact your own design style, your own aesthetic, you know, and uh, it's, it's really, it's, it's awesome. I'm really glad to hear that. So thank you. Well, um, and it also yeah. gave me, it also gave me confidence coming back from those workshops and really finding my own style, you know, even from a, a local competition standpoint with, a, with other florists, like I feel more comfortable if somebody comes to me now and asks me for a style that I don't embrace and that I'm not about, you know, to say, Hey, that's not really my style, but I'd highly recommend you go to this florist. That's more their style. And I think you would be a perfect match. So, you know, even for clients, I want them to find me because they like what I'm doing and they like my style and they like the look of what I'm doing, not just because, you know, they found me on the knot or I'm the cheapest or whatever. I want them to like me for who I am and my design style. Yep. Mm. Oh, that's powerful. And you know, it's freeing in a way. You don't feel this pressure to do something that's not you. Um, and it's so hard to do that sometimes. Well, and I, I mean, I was thinking about that. I think it kind of like leads back to the fact like, hey, we have a flower farm. That is my first and foremost, my, my primary goal is to run my flower farm. The wedding stuff is on the side and it's, it's extra. So it's kind of nice also having that mm. as like, okay, that's kind of my if I don't get a lot of weddings, I still have the flower farm to run. And it, it, it gives me a little bit more security maybe as I'm having those discussions. So it's helped with my self-identity from a design standpoint and, and working with clients. That's great. I love that. Now, I know one of the things that I was fascinated about when we talked earlier was just, uh, and you've, you've already talked about it a little bit about people coming to the farm to do, you know, 
cut your own bouquets or photo shoots or things like that. Um, I feel like you really are intentional about having your farm be uh, a destination. Um, and I'd love to kind of learn more about that because I feel like sometimes that's for flower farmers, not everyone's comfortable with that and that's okay. But if they are, then that sometimes could be money left on the table. That's an opportunity for additional revenue streams. So I'd love to kind of unpack that a little bit and just talk about, um, I think the phrase you used was agritourism. So, I mean, I'm kind of curious how you, how you process that or envision that. Yeah. Well, I think um, the number one thing that guides us is what would, what do we want to do on our farm? And what would we enjoy doing? The floral design classes came first and it was an easy thing because it was something we wanted to do. So that's really kind of our, our guiding light is what, what do we want to do? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that makes it easy. Yeah. And I don't, I, we love having people out to the farm. We want people to experience it, but I will say like, like you've heard me, you heard me say before, we don't leave the gate wide open. Literally, we want to have small controlled events where we really know who's who's on our farm right now. Yeah. And so we tr we try to do, you know, we do a lot of agritourism things. We want to make sure though that we know and we do them ticketed, so that we have a name and we have some idea of the people that are here visiting us. And again, it's like what Adam said, it's at our house. So we really want to make sure that. We keep them a little bit smaller and, and we know we know our customers. Yeah. And to expand on what I said, uh, you know, kind of echoing Jen is keeping it small and intimate. And we want people to come out and be inspired and be in wonder because it, it, it's like a cyclical, we call it cyclical inspiration. Like we're inspired by their inspiration and they're inspired, you know, it's a big start. It's a cycle of inspiration. We love it. <laughs> um, so it, it, that's really a lot. Uh, that's really how it kind of guides what we do on the farm and why we keep it small and keep things intimate. And, um, you know, we don't want to burn ourselves out on anything. So that's why we only do like maybe four or five floral design classes a year. Um, you know, we have some events we'll just only do once a year yeah. because we want it to be something very special. Sure, sure. Yeah, you want it to become just sort of, you know, like every weekend is something. Um, yeah. How? So, how? Let me ask this question: How do you do that? I know you want to have controlled ticketing, and 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 like, what is the max number of people you want on a farm on a given day, and and how do you sell tickets? I'm just curious. Well, our large our largest event that we've ever had out here was 400 people. Oh my god! And I think yeah, and I think that was probably our max. What What do you think we had? 200 cars? <laughs> yeah, it was it, insane. Yeah, I think we think our max for something really big is like four or 500 people, uh, which we've done with our yoga on the farm event. Yeah. Um, but over no, what no. period of time is that? Is that like over all day or is that over a window of time? It is a kind of a weekend window. So oh, okay. um, we haven't done it for the past couple of years, but it's right. like a mini yoga festival that uh, a friend of ours, Good Vibes Yoga, uh, he, he hosts the event and he does all the planning and everything. We basically just have the farm for him to use. Um, so it takes a lot of burden off of us because it, it's a it's a big thing to plan. He puts a lot of work into but it. But we've done Mother's uh, Mother's Day brunches. So we have an al fresco dinner series that we do every year, and it's this will be the third year we do it. Mm -hmm. It really started because of uh, restrictions with you know social distancing and stuff like that. And we're like, okay, uh, we do farm to table dinners here on the farm, but we can't do them where people are sitting side by side. So we came up with the al fresco series with a local caterer. And we do a three dinner series each and every year. The first one is Mother's Day. The second one is a lavender in bloom dinner. And then the third one is dahlias in bloom. And the dinners are centered around those three times. And we can accommodate about 150 for the dinner. We literally put tables and chairs around in our flower fields and sit people around the farm. We like to do kind of a Instagrammable, Instagrammable moment with a, a photo backdrop. Somebody brought an old 
dump truck. It was an old, oh, yes. <laughs> old Sanford 66. And we put hay bales in front and we put all the flowers in front, especially for the Mother's Day brunch, because as you can imagine, May in Iowa, things are just starting to roll. We might have tulips and daffodils in bloom, but not a lot of flowers. Things are just, you know, there's a lot of brown soil. Showing. Yeah. <laughs> but we, we have really enjoyed this change to the alfresco dinners. It is, you know, uh, when we do a farm to table here in our little event barn, it's 36 people max. Um, but these alfresco dinners with 150 people are surprisingly an amazing amount less work for us to do. And Jen and I are able to actually host and schmooze a little bit with everybody that's here on the farm. Um, we've enjoyed them immensely. But a lot of it has to do with the team that we work with, the caterer that we work with, Tangerine Food Company. Uh, they are amazing in taking care of everything that lets us get out there and uh, host. Yeah, That's but those cool. are the wow. those are, those are the biggest events we do. But we try to keep them pretty small. So I think about the the VIP Sunset Tour. We literally try to keep it to twenty people max for those yep. because again, we feel like people are buying a more elevated experience. We really want them to have that one-on-one -on -one time with us. Yeah. Yeah. Our tours 20 is a good number for us because we're outside, we're giving the tour and then we cut people loose to cut their own bouquet and take a zillion selfies because they're at sunset. But that's another one of those things. We kind of have to feel, feel out our audience again for those VIP sunset tours. Some of them really want us to you know, be with them, talk to them a lot, give a big tour. And others are like, get out of my hair. I want to take some sunset <laughs> yeah. selfies and the flowers, you know? And yeah. you, again, you really have to, you have to gauge your audience. And usually it's like half and half, half are like, let me, let me go. Let me cut and take yeah. selfies and the flowers. Are and, you guys done yet? I want to get out. I know. Here. Right. Right. And others are like, uh, I want to know more about your farm. So we try to grab the people who want to know a little bit more and make sure that we give them a little bit more of a one-on-one -on -one time to let them ask those questions. Yeah, and they'll grab us. You know, when we cut people loose, a lot of people hang around because they want to know more about the farm, more yeah. information. Yep. So. so how many, I mean, is it like two times a month? Obviously, the summer months are probably more than the winter months, obviously. But I'm just saying like when you're in production, how often do you think you have an event? Um, big or little, whatever. Probably four, four or five a month, sometimes two a weekend. It just, it depends. Yeah. Oh, okay. We do our, we offer our own classes here on the farm that we teach. And then we also have guest teachers come in and teach uh, where, you know, we just want to really provide cool experiences on the farm that nobody has access to. So I think about lavender soap making. We don't teach that class. We actually have a, a guest teacher come in and wow. teach people how to make lavender soap. Again, something that is kind of botanically inspired. It has a synergy with our business because we have a flower farm, but it's not something that we do know how to make soap. But, you know, teaching a large audience of people, it's just not really, our, you know, where our core is. So bringing somebody else in to guest teach that absolutely amazing. And then the stress is off of us. We don't have yeah. to prep for that class, get ready for it other than, you know, making sure everything's tidy and we greet people and have a welcoming atmosphere. Mm. But yeah, yeah. We try to keep them intimate because we did notice if you do too many, it becomes too like, uh, they're open again, or, uh, they're having another event. Yeah. So we really try to keep them small, intimate and scarce. So, you know, soap making, for example, only a couple classes a season. We want to keep it very exclusive. Sure. Well, I can imagine how draining it could be to host, you know, these big crowds of people all the time. So having small crowds just feels more manageable and enjoyable for everybody. You too. Yes. So, um, yeah. Oh, it, is, it is draining, like, you know, especially for the big dinners, setting them up the day before and then the cleanup the next day. It's like, oh my gosh, it's a lot. It is very much a lot. And we usually have farmer's market going. I, sometimes I have weddings those weekends. It gets a little crazy. I've been trying to get a little bit better about managing my schedule and like, okay, no weddings that weekend. Don't do it. Yeah. <laughs> He's looking at me because I'm the one who always like overextends myself. And inevitably, like there's always the, like these double bookings where I book myself multiple times and I'm like, why did I do that? <laughs> I, I like to be underextended. <laughs> yeah. 
<laughs> well, if you're anything like me, I have this weird problem where I have like two calendars in my head and this calendar and this calendar don't always sync. And so there's these times where I'm like, what was I thinking when I'm like, all right, you know, uh, uh, just crazy. Well, I figure sometimes it's like with weddings, like you probably send out you probably send out a quote and people are thinking about it and then you end up booking the big event and then the the person with the wedding comes right. back and says yes i accept your quote yeah <laughs> and i i think that's how it happens it's like you know ships crossing in the night and then oops sure. I'm double booked I'm <laughs> double booked for that weekend whoops well okay so one question that i feel um that i've heard before that i'm just dying to ask is when you are having these events and people are coming to your farm I know that so many times I hear, um, but my farm, it always looks like a wreck or oh, there's always weeds or there's always these things. And I'm just curious, how do you manage that? Or do you just sort of, you know, you're okay with a certain level of chaos or, or is it always pristine at Pepper Harrow? <laughs> oh, yes. Yeah. Yes. Always pristine. <laughs> always. No. We, we really work to keep the farm tidy um, and really honestly, keeping it mowed just goes miles and miles, but we have desig a couple of designated ugly areas where equipment <laughs> goes. And, you know, there's one like back behind the greenhouse that, you know, if people want to see the reality of the, of the farm, they, they can walk back there, but, um, it's like the 10 second rule. What, what a people, people's impression are going to be developed on the first 10 seconds that they see something. I think we knew being open to the public, we had to up our ante on the cleanliness of our farm and really have things a lot more tidy than we used to have in the past. Yeah. So yeah, I, mowing is one of the, the key things, having everything mulched in and looking amazing. But yeah, it is something we constantly think about. And sometimes too, you know, we have our employees come in and we have them look at it with blind eyes, you know, mm, yeah. it's like when you're at your own house, you don't see your own mess until you get ready to have guests over. Uh, and that's when we really see our own messes, like, okay, people are coming, what looks bad. And sometimes we have to have our employees tell us like, okay, guys, what looks bad here? We can't see it. Like we kind of get a little bit blinded to it sometimes. Mm -hmm. Um, but yeah, the threat of having company over, we're like, oh, oh, <laughs> hide that, burn that, do this. <laughs> yeah, burn that. I love that. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, honestly, you know, you probably know after your perennials are done uh, in like that mid spring sprint, sometimes they just start looking a little tired. And there's really nothing you can do about that other than like cut them down and mulch them in a little bit just to give a nice top dress. But yeah, we've really had to up our ante and like making things look really nice. But I'm looking at Adam because I'm like, there's a, a big messy farm area behind the barn. I'm like, we need to fence it all in so nobody can see it. Yeah, <laughs> we need a six foot fence. Yeah, but you know what? I think people, people are very accepting. They know they're coming to a farm. They know they're going to see some messes. Like it's a farm. It's a working farm at that. But uh, being a flower farm, we do know it has to be a little bit more beautiful than the average farm people go and visit. And sure. luckily, luckily, the flowers do a lot of the work in like really making it look <laughs> spectacular, right? And uh, even the messes have to look beautiful, if that makes sense. You know, it has to say, oh, this is just such a farm. This is so farmy. I just love it. <laughs> oh? Yeah, like the equipment. No, I don't know. no, I'm like, get rid of the equipment, hide it. <laughs> I think so. Anyway. Well, Honestly, it's so like, funny when I had, when my kids were little and we would be at the farm, it'd be fun to like, Oh, let's go get on the tractor and oh, let's do some pictures and you know, that kind of stuff. So equipment can be fun. Well, we do actually leave the tractor. <laughs> I was looking at it. Yeah. I park the tractor in a spot and secure it because the kids die to climb on the tractor. So we, we kind of put it in a pretty conspicuous place. So, um, uh, you, you know, it's like a little tractor playground for kids. Every single time we see little kids sitting, little boys, especially yeah. sitting up at, sitting up in the seat, sitting, you know, driving the tractor with dad sitting right by him. It's really cute to see. Oh, wow. That is neat. Well, yeah. how special. Well, I'm glad to hear that because I feel like, you know, and I think when you, um, when you know that these events on your property are going to be part of your everyday you know, your, your income stream, you probably can plan and you can probably organize things in a way that you might not, if 
it's just a spontaneous once or twice a year. And then it's kind of like, oh, I guess I need to clean that up now. As opposed to, okay, I, you know, an ounce of prevention is a pound of cure, that sort of a thing. And, and being proactive as you go along. So, um, well, I'm, I'm kind of, I'm glad to hear that. Cause that's, and I, I agree with you too. Sometimes when they see the flowers, they don't see anything else anyway. So it's kind yeah. of, um, out of, you know, it's not part of the, the, the experience really. So, um, that's really great. Well, I, I'm kind of curious if someone is interested in doing more of this, are there any things that you've learned along the, I know you've shared a lot of things about group size has been important, but anything else that you've learned along the way that maybe could help people troubleshoot ahead of time? I, well, my biggest piece of advice is growing slowly and deliberately. I think that has, uh, you know, we've approached everything cautiously. We, I mean, I guess there's some things we've jumped into, but our farm in general has grown slowly. And uh, I know, I think that's the best piece of advice that I would recommend for people. I don't know. People get a lot of, people ask us all the time about like insurance and things like right. that, liability, you know, separate your house from your property just to, you know, help protect your assets, um, you know, constantly consult a, a lawyer and start having those discussions and split it out, contact your insurance company and find out how you would go about holding events like that and make sure that you have that all taken care of, you know, from a, a liability policy and all, all the things. And it varies from state to state from, you know, county to county. So we recommend everybody go do their investigation separately. We're definitely not experts on that in every state. Uh, and even from every city's municipality, like the rules can be different from you know, town to town. So it's worth going and checking out and asking your local community HOA, make sure everything's okay from that standpoint. Cause yeah, there's been a lot of people that have HOAs and they're like, uh, I don't know if I can hold events at my property because I'm in an HOA. Those are all things to address and, right. and take up and find out before you start getting into things. Uh, but you know, maybe too, the best, the best advice is like setting expectations with people who are coming out to your property in advance make sure they know if, you know, if there's certain areas they're not supposed to get in, just, you know, gently call that out in the reminder email that you send out, mm -hmm. make sure people know the rules or, you know, have those areas roped off if they're not, you know, places where people should be, things like that. Right. Mm -hmm. But for the most part, you know, we know when people are coming out to our farm, they're going to be all over the place. So Adam's done a really great job about mowing trails. So we actually have a little mm. nature trail going around the property. We basically know for the most part, a lot of the property is on limits and we want to make it open and welcoming for people. So, you know, do, do the best you can to your ability to really clean things up, make it a safe environment for people to come out and visit. And then, uh, you know, start with one event. Yeah. And yeah. make sure people really feel welcome and enjoy it. So part of that you could experience we offer is like we tell people, you know, from 12 o'clock noon until four o'clock PM, this is your farm. You are our guests. Please feel free to bring out a picnic lunch, uh, you know, whatever you want, sit out here and enjoy yourselves. And we really want people to enjoy our farm. It, it delights us to see that. Yeah. We love it. in a you cut event, you know, when people, come out and just cut their flowers and, you know, take a little tour and go. It, it's great. But the, the people that we're really charmed by are the people who bring a full picnic lunch and stay oh, man. and enjoy the farm and tour it and check everything out. Like we're tickled by that. We really love that. That's great. And I, I wanted to ask this earlier and I probably should have uh, in a different way. I, like, do you use, a program to sell tickets? Do you use Shopify, Eventbrite? Uh, who, well, how do you do that? Uh, we do it through our website, Squarespace. Okay. Um, they do have an, a new event management platform that they kind of put out. I, I don't know if it's beta or what, but it's just clunky and I don't like it. And it, it's, you know, it, we, when we want someone on our website, we want them to stay on our website. And this is an external place that it sends them. So we do a lot of kind of manual management on our Squarespace website. Okay. So but it works, it works well. Okay, good. Yeah. Cause I didn't know that. And I mean, we use Squarespace, but I didn't um, 
realize they have that that component of it. So that's that's great because I know a lot of people use it, and I think that's a good tool for for that. Um, I I often wonder too. Um, your part of the country is what zone are you guys growing in? I wanted to ask that earlier and I forgot. Yeah, we're actually growing in zone five, five B. And uh, I, I feel like we get to sneak a little bit more in every single year because it's getting a little bit warmer. So we sneak some things in. I still haven't gotten my, my qualms and cherry trees in yet. But <laughs> I, I really want them. <laughs> but yeah, we, we, it's very cold where we are. Actually, our zone can be warm. It can be warm. It can be cold. We're kind of in one of those crossroads from the jet streams where sometimes we can have an extremely warm spring. Sometimes we can have an extremely cold spring. So we never quite know what, what to expect. Wow. And when do you start planning your events? Like, do you know, like, like when the lavender is blooming, you know, the doubt, but on the early side, like mother's day, I mean, you could have snow on mother's day, right? No, (laughs) no, we will not have snow on mother's day. (laughs) No. Yeah. Mother's day is still pretty chilly. We we actually had our event last year. It was a little bit chilly. So we have to mitigate the risks there a little bit. And I feel like almost all of our events have some threat of rain. Always, always. It's so painful. So painful. So what we've started to do for our events is we started to put up a tent So the tent can fit 150 people under it. And if worse comes to worse, we put everybody under the tent. And for Mother's Day specifically, we have heaters out and going. And that's something we're adding this year because it was really chilly last year. It was a beautiful day though, right? Yeah, it did come turn out to be a beautiful day. There was a threat of rain and it's like, oh my gosh, it's very difficult to deal with that. So do you have a backup plan if you, if you, plan on doing events, you know, have, have the tent, have the warmers going things that are going to make people feel comfortable and welcome. And, you know, people were like, if, if you, you know, we were like, Oh, it's going to be a takeaway dinner. And they're like, "Uh -uh, I'm coming to your farm because I want to see your farm. So you have to be ready to adjust and kind of pivot a little bit. Mm -hmm. Having a backup plan is always a good idea. And we actually have had threats of rain. Um, but Luckily for us, the skies always seem to part right before the event. There was that one that it rained for like 10 minutes, but we've been lucky with really beautiful weather all the time. That's all amazing. Well, and, and then you also have your, your event barn, like you're in right now. Um, so you do have some, you know, even if it's only a, a short shower or something like that, you have a little bit of uh, grace there that you can maneuver around probably. So yeah, people yeah. were coming in here and then actually they were going and sitting in their cars for a few minutes. I, I think that's one good thing about technology is like they can look at the radar, they can see, Oh sure. yeah, it's just going to rain a little bit. And then it's done. They were literally sitting in their cars, the rain passed, they got back out. And I actually, they were like greeted with a rainbow afterwards. For yeah. That one it, event. it was stunning. And like, it was a, it was a good thing. It, it was a very, very short rain. And yeah, there was a rain. Yeah. Cause we have that picture of you, like with the rainbow Holding in your hand. The rainbow <laughs> on my hand. Well, and it actually came from, because we were watching guests that had come to the dinner and it was somebody's birthday and all the girls were like holding the rainbow. I'm like, I want to do that too. <laughs> but again, see cyclical inspiration. One of the best shots ever. The, the sun came out, there was a rainbow. And then you can see the lavender fields in full bloom in the background. Yeah. It's- absolutely insanely gorgeous. Oh, wow. Yeah. wow. I know some of the images you've shared with me already, seeing the lavender and bloom, I'm, it's just, I can't imagine the fragrance of just being in that field. And, you know, it's just between the color and the fragrance and um, it's amazing. Why did you choose lavender? Why did you want to uh, really focus on that? Well, it was my idea. So that's why Adam's looking at me. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, Well, I was like, you know, well, I was seeing a bunch of people in Michigan growing lavender. I'm like, wow, you know, if people, Michigan's colder than us, if they can grow lavender, I can grow lavender. And I was really thinking about not only the beauty of the plants growing in the field, I was like thinking about all of the things you could do with lavender. And I've always been inspired by botanicals, uh, herbs and botanicals really. And you know, how to distill them and how to use them medicinally and things like that. So that, that was really where it it all began is 
even when we moved to the farm, I was like looking like, okay, how can I make tinctures and things with like chamomile and mint and, you know, all, all plantain and all these salves and things. So lavender was really the gateway for that. You know, once I figured out, I had been testing, we've been on the farm for 11 years and two years in, I started experimenting with lavender and it wasn't until year well, nine, it wasn't until year nine where we actually planted our field. So from- Is it nine? Uh, eight? Eight. Yeah, okay, eight. Yeah. But two, two years in, I started. And so, you know, you can kind of get an idea. I experimented with how to grow lavender successfully here in central Iowa in the Midwest, it's really difficult because it is so cold. Lavender doesn't want to survive very well here. So we really had to like test some things out and see what worked and what didn't work, but that's how we got to it. And now that we have, you know, two and a half acres, soon to be three and a half acres, we're making all of the lavender products. And, you know, it's really a joy for us to get to share it with people to do these lavender and bloom dinners. Uh, new this year, actually, we're doing a lavender picnic where we have little picnic baskets. We're providing people with charcuterie, keeping it again, very small and intimate. But I don't know if I told you this, but we were getting people sending us pictures of the, the lavender fields blooming in Italy with people having picnics in the middle of the lavender field. Literally on Instagram, we probably received it 50 50 times from different people, people who follow us, they sent it like, you guys should do this. You guys should do this. I'm like, <laughs> I love you guys. Thank you. But yeah, That's we got awesome. the hint, F 50 messages, like you guys need to do this. And so I was like, okay, you know, girls got to take a hint. <laughs> <laughs> so we're coordinating that for this year and we have our little picnic baskets and stuff. And that's going to be something new that we add this year, but really it's about the experience of the lavender, the pictures of people in the lavender, and then all the different products that we can make. And we actually distill our own lavender here on the farm and Adam's like the distilling king. So he's, he's my tech nerd. <laughs> <laughs> I hand all the technical stuff off, all technical, mechanical, anything. He is like a whiz at all that stuff. So he does. I all. just like learning. <laughs> he does. He does. He's like, Learning's he, my hobby. Oh, and you're so good. <laughs> But yeah, he's, awesome. he's the guy I'll throw my iPhone at him. Like figure this out for me. I don't know what to do. <laughs> he does all the things. So yeah, he's the one that distills all of the lavender, but what, how much, how much do we usually distill at a time? Um, probably hundred, 150 pounds. Yeah. Crazy. Yeah. And you'll be shocked. Like we usually only get like 20 ounces of oil out of that max. Yeah. It's a lot yeah. of lavender and a very little yield. And that's pretty common. That's, that's why lavender essential oil is so expensive. It takes a lot of material to produce a little amount of oil. Wow. I had no idea. It was that yes. kind of a ratio. Wow. That's, that's shocking actually. Yep. And very um, labor intensive to produce it. Can't imagine. Um, so I'm just thinking about this. Uh, you guys are both now full time doing this on the farm, but that wasn't how it all began. I'm kind of curious, how did you guys transition in, into making it to this point? Well, Adam, I'll let you lead off. Adam was first full time on the farm while I was working. Um, I, my background, I worked in the oil fields in Alaska and the, the Arctic. So I would travel. It was a rotating schedule, two weeks on, two weeks off. So that was, well, that was how we were able to buy the farm <laughs> was the suffering of working in the oil field. Uh, but that rotating schedule really allowed us to live anywhere in the country. So we moved here and uh, it, just soon after that, one of us eventually, we got big enough that one of us had to step off the cliff and. Well, yeah, it was five years in. So we are five years into flower farming. Uh, we had both worked full-time jobs up until that point. We were running ourselves ragged and mm -hmm. year five, we we're like, okay, so we're at a breaking point here. Sure. Either, either somebody needs to step back or we need to, you know, maybe not do flower farming or, you know, whatever. But I mean, we loved it and we had really built a nice following. It's like, okay, this is going to be scary, but Adam was the first one to. Yeah. It, and it was, it was weird and scary though. Just sort of like, okay, this is it. Here I am. I, the whole experience <laughs> has been scary. I mean, yeah. even, and then COVID is what finally sent mm. me to the farm full time and totally fine. I, I said, it's the thing that made me break through my golden handcuffs and free me from working a full-time job. Yeah. But I'm like, wait, I kind of missed that full-time salary. That was really nice. But it, it, it was a couple of years of 
Jen, you got to step off the cliff too. I was so scared. Yeah, there's a, there's a, it's going to be so powerful when both of us roam the farm. I got pushed out of the nest and, and she it got was, pushed off the cliff. It was <laughs> the best thing ever. Yes. It was the best thing ever, but still scary. You know, yeah. like there's those little things like benefits, you know, yeah. that you're like, oh, I have to pay for those out of pocket now. That's uh, really hard, very yeah. hard. But, and, and to pay ourselves, <laughs> so scary. But man, it is the best thing that has ever happened to us. I think this, we're getting ready. This is my year three mm -hmm. going into being full-time on the farm. And it really makes you appreciate working for yourself. And, you know, going into year three, I, I told Adam, I said, I don't think I can ever go back to working a full-time job because being able to create my own schedule and work for myself and, and know everything I'm doing goes directly back to myself. Like all my hard work, like benefits me instead of somebody else. Like, I, I don't know if I can go back to the constraints of working for a corporation again. No. <laughs> yeah, I understand. Well, I mean, having been that recently, you know, I've moved back into wholesale after, you know, podcasting full-time for a year and a half. Um, I completely agree. It, it It is challenging. And it's like, gosh, there was a lot of freedom that I gave up. I didn't realize that um, I had, but you know, it is what it is. And it's, it's, it's actually been a good thing for me, but it's, um, but it is very, very challenging. I can't imagine getting used to being, you know, on the farm and, and everything that you guys do and, and then having to, yeah, yeah, it's. Oh yeah. People yeah. were like, you worked full time all that time and you were doing this on the side. Well, yeah. How? Yeah, how? And we, yeah. and we have three kids and uh, that was the other thing to like throw it in. Like, yeah, there's been sometimes even with this, you know, being full time on the farm where I'm like, oh my gosh, how are we doing this? Like mm -hmm. all the kids events, we, we actually had a graduating senior last year. And I think that was the true test. We, and <laughs> you know, he was running state track and he had prom and he had this and, and graduation. I'm like, oh my gosh, I was running myself <laughs> ragged. It was crazy. And then all the other farm events and things right. like that. I'm like, oh at, my yeah. goodness. And at the beginning of the season. Yeah. I yeah. was a little yeah. overextended last year, but yeah, you just wonder too, then how did I do a full-time job on top of that before craziness? Well, speaking of being overextended, <clears throat> I, <laughs> I, um, you guys have a book coming out. Yes. Yep. And you're so excited. I know. So tell us a little bit about that when and how and where, and what's it about? Yep. Yeah, um, so the book is called small farm, big dreams. It mm -hmm. is due out in April. It's available for pre-order now on our website or wherever you can order books. Uh, we are talking Barnes and Nobles, Target, Amazon, all the places. Our website. I said that. Oh, did you say that? Yes. I'm sorry. <laughs> of sorry. course, of course. Uh, it's been really fun. We're doing pre-orders on our website and uh, it's basically signed copies. So if you pre-order now, we'll sign, send you a signed copy. And uh, if for those who are interested in coming to the farm, you can pick up your signed copy and uh, you have the offer to come to our launch party. We're actually going to do a book launch party here on the farm. And I'm really excited about that too, because it's like, all of our best supporters are coming to that. They have an opportunity to see our farm, visit with us. Really, really fun. When is um, that? Uh, we have it set right now for May 1st. We haven't okay. sent details out to yeah, everyone yet, well, but it, May 1st is the date. It's tentative because uh, there are some supply shortages with paper uh, and stuff like that. So we're... We haven't yeah. fully locked in May 1st, yeah. but for us, that like, like that's yeah. the best. We want May 1st. <laughs> we know once we get past May 1st, we get wrapped up in flower farming yeah. activities. That's planting time. So it's like, uh, uh oh, that's go time. We need to not have it be anything more than May 1st. Yeah. So what's but the yeah. book about? Did you say, I'm, maybe I missed that. Did it's flower farm. It's a book about flower farming and flower farming lifestyle. So not only do we incorporate in what we're doing here from a flower farming perspective, we also give like, you know, we talk about our events. We talk about how to run a CSA, how we do that bouquet combinations, um, you know, how you could do this in your own backyard. So we don't, we didn't want to limit ourselves to just, you know, Hey, this is a book for flower farmers. Sure. We really want to, yeah. we really want to inspire, like anybody could do what we're doing. It's just a matter of scale. You could literally do this in an urban area in a backyard. And we want to inspire those folks to like, you know, you don't have to do all the things, but you know, Hey, if you wanted to have a, a party, 
and pull together, you know, flower arranging classes, like a flower arranging party for you and all your, your friends, you can totally do that. And that's part of the joy, like enjoy your flowers. And we want to inspire people to really enjoy growing flowers to even just attempt to grow flowers. There's a lot of people who I think need a little, a little inspiration to demystify a lot of flower growing tips and tricks. And we do that in this book. Yeah. It's not, it's not overwhelming with too much technical information. It is, we want people to come away with, I can do this. Whoa, this, you know, it, it's great. Yeah. yeah. Even if you only take away a small tip from it, we're like, our work here is done. We've, we've either inspired you or given you some sort of, you know, hope that you can overcome whatever challenges you're facing with, with growing specifically. Yeah. That's great. Well, I know you, I guess that was the cover that I saw when you sent me. I'm like, what an amazing cover. I, I was like, I mean, I couldn't wait to turn the page, but I'll have to wait. So that'll be oh, awesome. Thank you. Scott will totally send you a copy of the book. <laughs> but yeah, we were, that was the, the cover photo was one we took with a, a local photographer, Allie Carroll, and she is an incredible talent. I mean, just the images that we were seeing come in and we were like, will you help us please with the cover of the book? Because, you know, it's so challenging. Like, how do you, you know, it's really hard to discover, to pick a cover photo too. Mm-hmm. We had like several images that we were looking at, but that was the one we ended up settling on with Adam and I out in our flower field, cutting, actually harvesting flowers. She was like, you need to get out there and you need to cut some flowers and show us how it's done. And mm-hmm. so we were out there cutting flowers together and she snapped a really candid moment of us we were talking, we were cutting all the flowers. So, you know, it kind of looks like, you know, when you look at the cover, like, what are they talking about? I see they're cutting flowers, but what are they? They're having a conversation. <laughs> yeah. Yes, we really were. It was really cool <laughs> to see. It's funny. That's so yeah. cool. Yeah. But well, yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. What one thing that, you know, after we were talking about the book, we just came off of doing the Northwest Garden and Flower Festival right. in Seattle. And we gave a talk on flower farming tips for the backyard cutting garden. And people were walking up to us after our our talk was over and they're like, Hey, everything you talked about, is that in your new book? Yes, you bet it is. So (laughs) that, that for me was like affirmation, like, okay, what I just wrote this book about people are interested in, and they really got a lot of out of our talks. So I'm like, yeah, all that stuff's in this book and you're going to be able to get all the inspiration out of here. So that was really cool to hear. And, you know, we didn't know we wrote this book with not a ton of feedback from outside influences. We just kind of wrote a book about what we knew, we knew a lot about and things we thought people would be interested in. Yeah. We did have some feedback from like our YouTube channel and stuff like that. We knew what people had been asking, but as we were writing it, we're like, are we going the right direction here? You know, we don't want to recreate the wheel. We don't want to do what other flower farmers have done and really write a manual on flower farming. It's not that we really wanted to, you know, be, to demystify yeah, the process, just yeah. be attainable and inspiring. And that's what this book is all about. And yeah. I think we nailed it. We really did. So yeah, we'll totally send you a signed copy. We'd love mm. for you to check it out. That's awesome. Well, thank you. And, and, and the thing I, I love about what you just said is you know, how many times do people have, they don't realize that their own backyard, their own little living space, they can grow flowers, they can cut them, they can enjoy them. It doesn't, you you don't have to have acres and acres. You don't even have to have a half an, I mean, it's like you can do this and enjoy it and bring it inside. And I just, uh, I love that. So that's awesome. and, and, And that thing we were kind of perplexed about is people think that, I, it's like a zonal thing. People think like, oh, that's not my zone. It's not the same, but really you probably know this. It's like, you can still talk about growing the same flowers and you just have to apply the different timelines to your zone. It's not a completely different ball game. It's just that you have to figure out the right times to plant the certain things that we're talking about flower wise. And that was, that was the big takeaway from Seattle is like, they're like, oh, we're in different zones that doesn't apply. And I'm like, it does still apply. You just have different, a different zone. You have a different planting timeline Mm -hmm. of when you would do these certain things like zinnias, for example, Right. we were like for somebody in Seattle. Yeah. Obviously you're not going to do that in your rainy season. (laughs) 
<laughs> they like warmth and dry. So you're going to do that in the height of your season. You're going to look to do that when it's not raining as much, when it's a little bit drier out. And yes, that does actually happen in the Pacific Northwest. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, zone, zonal wise, that was the other thing. Like, you know, yeah, you can do it in your backyard and you can do this no matter what zone you're in. It's just a matter of adjusting and figuring out the right timing for when to do certain things, right? Yeah, absolutely. And and the thing is, is really when it comes down to the, the flowers, maybe you can or can't grow. It's such a minuscule number of flowers. It's, it's not worth getting hung up on that. And it's exactly what you said. It's just tweaking your timeline. So um, I, I love that. And I can't, I can't wait for the book to come out. So uh, this has been great. Thank you so much, uh, Jen and Adam, for being on the Flower Podcast. Well, thank yeah. you for having thanks us, for Scott. Having us. This has been such a fun time. <laughs>